Okay, it's my pleasure, my distinct pleasure, uh, to welcome Dean Van Galen uh, to the MKRC seminar series. Uh, Dr. Van Galen was selected by the Board of Governors and introduced as the sixth president of MSSU uh, this May, and that was following a national search. By way of introduction, prior to coming to MSSU, Dr. Van Galen served as chancellor of the University of Wisconsin River Falls for 11 years. He's a Wisconsin native and 1982 alumnus of Wisconsin Whitewater. Both he and his wife, like many MSSU students, and I would add some KCU students, are first generation college students as well as first generation medical students. Going back a little further in time, Dr. Van Galen earned a PhD in analytical chemistry at K-State University and did postdoctoral chemistry research at University of California at Berkeley, uh, having to do with porphyrin rings and oxygen electron transport uh, with implications in fuel cell development. So here comes the uh, Missouri connection. After his postdoc, he began an academic career in 1987 as a chemistry professor at Truman State University. And just so you know, I was graduating undergraduate at, in that year, I'm fairly certain. He later served as vice president for the U university advancement at Truman um, and served as vice president for development and university advancement at University of West Florida in Pensacola, where he played around with nearly $40 million uh, and was able to, to garner that funding for uh, New, uh, West Florida University. So undoubtedly, he brings to Missouri Southern significant academic and leadership experience, particularly in fundraising and governmental relations, as well as a philosophy that I think we all share, uh, that student learning and success must be at the heart of the university's mission. So Dr. Van Galen, welcome. Welcome to Joplin. Welcome to MSSU. Welcome to the MKRC Cinema series. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation to be part of the seminar seminar series today. Uh, it's great to be in Joplin. It's great to be in Missouri Southern at a very interesting time, of course. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for kind of tuning in today and devoting some time um, and spending that with me. Uh, I gave some thought in terms of what uh, what I wanted to focus on today. And, uh, you know, I'm an analytical chemist, so I could talk about electrochemical generation of carbene and nitrine anion radicals, which was my thesis, but I thought, no, I think I'm going to skip that today. I could talk about just Missouri Southern, and I will talk about the university some, uh, but I thought it might be interesting for this group uh, if I focus on three different topics, and if it's possible, I'd love to make this uh, you know, somewhat interactive, maybe after each of the three sections. So I'd like to talk about um, a little bit the, about the value of higher education. And I have brought some information, some data that um, I think you might find interesting. Uh, the second part is a little bit about innovation and uh, sharing some, some thoughts and some information on, on what I believe to be the importance of innovation. What is innovation? How do we promote a culture of innovation in, in what we do. And then I will talk a little bit about Missouri Southern, uh, including you know, the KCU partnership and some opportunities in the health sciences that have become really clear to me as I've learned more about this university and, and this region. So let me, let me begin by uh, speaking a little bit about, about higher education and some of this um, in a way, it may not surprise you, but uh, we'll see. So I'm going to pull up a few slides here. Are you able to see this? Yes. Okay. So I, I chose this topic in a way because of the conversations nationally about higher education and the value of a college degree. And a couple of things that I think we hear about uh, sometimes. One is uh, it's not worth it, that, that going to college is uh, expensive. It's really uh, 
maybe even a, a waste of money or, or, or not, uh, not a good investment. Uh, and then the other debate that we often hear about is what is the purpose of college? So on one hand, uh, some people would say it is about getting a liberal education and developing good citizens uh, in a democracy. Uh, and then on the other hand, people will say, well, it's really exclusively about training, getting a job, uh, producing an income, and having a productive career. Now, my view on that, that second point is it is really about both of those things. Um, certainly, students and, and expectations of our nation should be that students do progress. They're prepared for uh, gainful employment and productive careers. But I also believe very much that a college experience is also about becoming well-educated, well-rounded, uh, promoting good citizenship. And I also believe very strongly that those two uh, need not be at odds. They are very much connected. If you speak with CEOs of companies, uh, yes, they're interested in hiring some accountants or some uh, you know, people skilled at IT, but also they want individuals who can think critically, communicate well, uh, work with diverse groups of people, uh, understand and value uh, a lot of different uh, aspects of life. And I suspect that when KCU interviews uh, for medical school positions and even for the Yours to Lose program here at MSSU, uh, that you're, you're looking for both of those things, uh, certainly academic quality expertise, but, but also um, someone who can become a whole person a whole empathetic, uh, effective physician. So this is just some background that maybe pushes back against some, some assumptions about higher ed we hear now and then. Uh, this information I'm sharing is from the college board. Uh, they do a annual report called Education Phase. So this, a lot of this data is current through about 2018. So this first slide is simply educational attainment. Uh, in American society, what percent of uh, individuals attain different degree levels? And you can see over time, as you move from bottom to top, how that has increased significantly from the 1940s, where about 6% of individuals aged 25 to 34 uh, possessed a, a bachelor's degree or higher, and now that's about uh, 39%. Uh, so to me, that's good news. Uh, certainly, our, our country has become much more well-educated, um, and you know that's one piece of data. It's interesting, perhaps, to look at how this varies by state. So nationally, and what you have here uh, on the left set of bars is the percent of adults with at least a baccalaureate degree, and then on the right, what percent of uh, traditional college-age students are enrolled in post-secondary education. So on the left, on average, about 32% of adults have at least a baccalaureate degree. This is in the age group 18 to 24 years old. Uh, you might find it interesting in a, uh, to look at different states, and I think that probably the individuals on this, this uh, seminar hail from different parts of the country. So if you look at Missouri, it's about 29%, about three percentage points lower nationally. Uh, Kansas, uh, our neighbor here in, in Joplin, is actually higher than that, uh, about 34%. Uh, but you can see significant variation uh, as you move down that chart. Uh, one of the things we hear is, you know, college graduates who can't get a job, who live in their parents' basements uh, the rest of their lives, right? And like everything, you can find college graduates who are doing just that. But if you look at the big picture statistically, uh, this demonstrates median earnings, uh, estimated taxes, actual tax income based on degree level. And you know, obviously this, uh, the more education that a person has, uh, the more their earnings uh, all the way up through doctoral degrees and, and professional degrees. And then you can look at it a different way in terms of cumulative lifetime earnings. Uh, again, for different educational attainment levels as a function of age. So for a baccalaureate degree, you can see that net earnings, and this is net of tuition, books, fees, supplies, 
Um, it's about $1.2 million or so for a bachelor's degree. Uh, so again, there's strong evidence on average that financially, uh, post-secondary higher education is, is a good investment. Uh, interestingly, this graph looks at how long does it take for you to essentially recoup what it costs to obtain a college degree. And so on the right, uh, you see those figures for a bachelor's degree. On the far right, if you complete a baccalaureate degree uh, on average at a uh, public or private nonprofit, uh, by the time you're 30, you have recouped your costs and exceeded earnings cumulatively uh, throughout your lifetime. And then, of course, it goes from there. Uh, unemployment, and again, this, this idea that college graduates can't get a job. Uh, obviously, this is pre-COVID data, but you can see historically, um, and I don't think it's surprising that more education leads to um, lower, in, lower unemployment rates. I also think it's fun to look at some of the other impacts of uh, higher education. Uh, this fascinates me, and I think as um, you being part of the medical community, and knowing the impacts of smoking, uh, has that on health. Oh, you go back to the 1940s and 50s and literally almost half of the individuals in the US age 25 or older uh, smoked. And also interestingly, if you look at the impact of education back in those days, it really didn't matter much what your level of education was. And then over time, you see the, uh, the changes to the point now where more education, um, and then, you know, you can think interestingly about kind of a chicken and an egg and what's going on there, but there's a significant difference. And, and of course, that has significant uh, impacts on health out outcomes as well. And then exercise, you know, um, again, higher, more education results in, um, more activity, more exercise, which has health impacts as well. Thought is interesting being in the 55 to 64 age group myself with a, at least a bachelor's degree, about 56% uh, of those individuals uh, enjoy vigorous exercise. So I'm almost done with these, uh, but I'm kind of making the point of not only the financial impacts and value of education, but also other types of impacts. Here we're looking at volunteerism as a function of uh, post-secondary education. You can see for all individuals having a advanced degree, for example, uh, about 52% of those individuals volunteer, uh, and you can see some of the variation there. And then voting rates uh, with an election coming up. Uh, again, significant difference, uh, higher voting rates, uh, the more education that that one uh, completes. Now I can, um, now I'll, I'll get rid of my slides here and make a couple comments. And then also see if there's any kind of questions or reaction to that. When I talk about this type of data, uh, I think it's very important to, to state that I'm certainly not claiming that more education yields a, a better or more valuable person. You know, my parents, neither of them graduated from high school. Um, they were great people. Uh, they supported me. They, they did a lot of good things in their life. Uh, so that's not the point. And I think those of us who have benefited from education always need to be very careful uh, to not imply there's some type of arrogance or we're, we're better because of our education. But I do think it's interesting to, to look at some of those broad impacts of, um, of education on individuals as well on, as on society and the public good. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to pause there for a minute to see if anyone has reaction or questions to that. Does anybody have any questions or reactions for our speaker? Uh, Ms. Boyer. Thank you for that. I appreciate seeing some of those graphs. I don't think that I've seen some of that before. Um, I 
did want to kind of point out the one though that was about the volunteerism um, because I think it might be fair to say that there's some bias there since employers of maybe the higher percentage of educated people provide us with hours to volunteer. And so I just wonder if there's a little bit of a difference in, and maybe those numbers would be better for people in those lower income jobs if they were given the hours to do that. Yes, I think on any of these, there's a lot underneath that data, you know, and, and to your point, let's say that um, I have less education. I, I may very well be working two jobs. Uh, I might uh, have a lot of commitments in the family. I, the time might be much shorter. You know, there's a lot that, that goes into that. And and I think many of these graphs and what is in them are they're connected in all sorts of interesting ways. So I, I think you make a really excellent point. Dr. Wolf, you. you have a question? You're muted, Dr. Wolf. Uh, you have me, okay, now I'm unmuted. You had me muted at some point there. Okay, so. Sorry. I was, I was going to comment that I was glad you raised your second point there. So I'm, I'm from small town Wisconsin, and I get on Facebook every now and then and engage with people who have a very healthy disrespect for science at this point in time. And, and so it's, you know, there's a questioning of the science, the denial of, of what, I accept as logic and facts, and therefore it, it's really hard even to engage them in, in conversation sometime. And, and the latest thing is, you know, how dare you brainwash my kids by teaching the value of diversity and things like that. And, and so I was curious, you know, you're operating at, a, at such a high level in academia. I'm curious to what extent that actually filters up to you. Well, it, uh, it does in different ways. Uh, you know, as a leader in higher ed, if I, not really since I've been here for six weeks, but uh, I've, I've gotten plenty of emails, messages from, from parents, uh, from students with those types of concerns. Uh, you know, I guess my, my view and my message is one of the purposes of higher education is not to tell people what to think, but to teach them how to think. And, you know, I taught a freshman seminar, an honors course a few years ago, and um, I think politically, you know, the group, and you, you're you from River Falls, which, you know, there are a lot of agricultural students there from, from small towns and farms, and you know, there's a real diversity of, of political views. And as we talked about, uh, issues such as as climate change, uh, you know, diversity, different cultures. Um, that was kind of my message: is um, you know, this is not about teaching you what to think. We're we're going to go through some information, some facts, uh, and so I think how that is done is important. Uh, but to your point, I, I do hear that you know sometimes, um, and sometimes very direct, uh, and other, other times more subtle. It, it's a challenge. I think how we present ourselves in higher education as leaders, as faculty, is important. And, and in a way, that's why I closed with that point about um, we have to be careful never, never to be perceived as arrogant, um, that we know it all if you people would just understand, right? Um, that's inappropriate and not and not productive. Um, but it's yeah, it, it's uh, it can be challenging. I was just going to follow up on that real quickly and and saying that is actually what I try to put across to people is why I think the way I think. I mean that that's among my observations is that so many people are set in their ways of thinking, but they can't necessarily defend it. And and so when you try to explain why then they just get mad and huffy. And, and so I, you, you, you struggle 
to, to kind of meet them on a common ground. And so theoretically what you're supposed to do is kind of sit there and have them recognize where you have a point of commonality, common values or whatever, and to try to prove to them that, that you are trying to achieve, you know, your, that your goals are similar or whatever. But I'm finding it, you know, extremely frustrating because people will just, you know, blow you off. They'll, they'll ignore you and keep spouting the same nonsensical rhetoric that somebody else has said. And it gets, it gets frustrating. I mean, how dare you correct somebody's um, misinformation on, on Facebook because uh, th that's what they want to believe. So I, I find it, you know, in these troubling times, especially uh, personally troubling. Well, and I think it's, I would take that and even take a, a little different perspective on it. Uh, and that's a value of building communication and relationships between people, students, faculty, uh, citizens with different views. And I think you alluded to the point that a lot of things are kind of polarized now in, in many ways in terms of thinking and information. Uh, but I recall when I taught this freshman honor seminar, we, we did a section on global and I identified some international students from India, China, South Korea, Europe, who were willing to come in. Uh, and after this, the class, which was um, quite homogeneous in itself, learned about these different countries. I then had them sit down in a small group with these students from India. Uh, Saudi Arabia, and, and for many of those students, that was the first time they spoke with a individual who was outside, you know, international student from a different country. And um, I just let those conversations go. And when I got my teaching evaluations from that course, most of the students said the best thing we did all semester was <laughs> to sit down with those individuals from a different country. I think they learned about a lot of commonalities, a lot of um, maybe pre-existing assumptions were, were brought down. Um, so I think all of us as educators need to look for these opportunities to, you know, to bring people together, um, not, you know, not necessarily just when there's the huge issue of the day, uh, when people are, are polarized, but how, how do you build those relationships? You know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I did not, really get to know someone from a different country and culture really till I was in graduate school. Um, but boy, once you do that, you the understanding you gain um, and the perspective you, you gain is tremendous. Extremely well said. Uh, Dr. Shinaro, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, thank you for letting me to talk. Uh, I'm Russian, and so I will not talk about <laughs> equity treatment, etc. So, because it is, you know, prejudice. But I'd like to tell you, so that is very important to bring for these discussions, is that uh, people with higher education, they usually have a health problem 20 years later than with the primary education. So, primary education, people with primary education, they have about at 50s, they already have a problems with their health, but educated people with high education, it's come by 70. And that's, I think it's a very, very important argument because you, you can talk about, I mean, high issues, et cetera, and they don't hear it. But when you say, you know that I will be sick at 70, but you will be sick at 50, that's probably makes sense for them. All right, so just a comment for that, yeah. for your presentation, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Talley, you have a question? Um, it, it was more recognizing what you were talking about, teaching people to think. And, you know, that's not an easy thing to do. I used to teach undergrad, and I just loved this one thing I did. And it was a, a course, and they had the whole semester to do it. They'd pick a, a deeply held belief, and, and they had to, it had to be deeply held. And then they would have to research and prove the opposite. Mm. And it was, it was fascinating to me because I learned a lot of things I never would have been exposed to. Um, I never went out of my way to. And so that kind of an experience can be profound. And I think that's another way 
it's a simple little task, but of teaching people to think. But I think what you said is absolutely important, teaching people to think. And, and I think that um, I think that's been an important message for me when I work with external groups, uh, government officials, and so forth, because you know they're concerned at times, and uh, perhaps there are times where it's valid. You know. You're, you're telling our students right yeah. what what to think, and that's uh, and I think that's an important message for for educators. Um, we all have our our beliefs. Um, now, we're also it's important to teach facts and information so that we all have well informed opinions. Um, but it's not our job to kind of on a lot of issues convince our students that. This is the only or right way to think. It's a delicate balance, but uh, um, so I don't know how we got so far down that road. But I guess it sounds it was of interest to people, so that's that's great. <laughs> Dr. Agnes, you have a question. Well, it's uh, rather than the comment. Well, the uh, president, thank you very much uh, uh, for the nice uh, presentation and uh, nice to meet you in virtually hopefully we'll yeah. meet you in person nice i liked your 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 comment and i really um piggy banging the doctor Tully's comment that uh, rather than then how what to teach but how to teach how to think i am i collect a mini book series um, from the foundation of the critical thinking one of which that i'm i am reading now it just reads that how to improve the student learning, how to think critically. These are really very, uh, I mean, almost, uh, how many, 40 pages and then easy to digest. I mean, the more that I read, then it's coming that the, how the teaching really is important. I would like to share one of my very sweet memory. Okay, I'm 25 years old and then a PhD uh, student in, in Hungary. And then my uh, uh, student cohort was very international. And then, uh, so my English level was in that time quite poor. I'm still working on it, but in that time it was a quite poor. What I feel deep inside, I had a difficulties to express. And then one of my former Yugoslavian uh, student fellow told me in one of the discussion that well, I'm from Turkey and then I'm a Muslim how you can be a science student or scientist while you are believing in God. I mean, you can imagine that I'm coming from a quite strong background and then I know how to express in Turkish language or I can't. You can imagine that how much, you know, that I was frustrated and then upset. And then what happened uh, once the dust settled down, I told her, okay, I should find out the way to express myself, how to teach them, mm. how to teach them. I can be a good and darn good scientist at the same time, a believer. And then two days later, she just came with the apology, Baki, I just wanted to know about your culture. I wanted to know how you are thinking. That's why my question. So that she understood that she really hit the... <laughs> <laughs> rock but uh, this little conversation you know the 30 years past I'm still using it rather than how to teach not the what to teach what to teach is my personal conviction you know that's whether I, I believe but okay how can I pack them how can I present them and then I have a very um, uh, philosophical uh, phrase that I always remind myself it reads that Open a window to the minds, but never take away the willpower. Hmm. Because we are individual, right? We can't really take the willpower. But I can open up the window that you can go through. Thank you. Very good. We can lead horses to water, but can we make them drink? <laughs> Shelly, you have a question. Ms. Boyer, go ahead. Yeah, I did. The last, you know, the last couple things that were said sort of about the, the diversity and what um, Dr. Talley and you yourself, your experiences that you have with your classes. I mean, we in a small 
sort of rural area that MSSU is located in and KCU is in Joplin. Um, and myself coming from a small town, I also graduated from Missouri Southern. So um, I would agree with the statement that graduate school exposes you to a lot, um, a, a lot more culture than what you get at an elementary school or a high school or, you know, a junior college level. And so I guess my question would be, how can we expose these types of situations to that diversity that might be eye-opening at a younger age? instead because some of these people are not going to make it to grad school right they're not going to have that opportunity like dr Ogbus just went through where you know where they remember these experiences and so um just kind of that question what, how do you think we can get this at a younger time in people's lives yeah that's a uh boy that, that's a separate seminar maybe right <laughs> um you know I think there are kind of fundamentally two two things to think about. One is, I guess, what's called compositional diversity. And and by the way, I, I define diversity pretty broadly, right? It, it, we sometimes focus on race and ethnicity, but um, you know, to me, it's a it's a a large idea. Um, but to put it this way, it's hard for people to learn about different perspectives, different people, if those people aren't around them, right? And so Missouri Southern, for example, has over 20% students of color, uh, which is really pretty significant, and that's grown quite a bit. Uh, and that's important. And so there's, a, there's opportunities for those types of interactions and, and relationships, not only to, to teach about diversity, uh, but to experience it for our students at at these personal uh, levels. But then the other part of that is how, how to do that. Uh, I do think that in the classroom, the more we move to collaborative learning styles, less lecture formats, group projects, okay, there's some opportunities there to work with people uh, different from yourself, um, different in, in all sorts of ways. Um, and then I think about outside the classroom, as well, and uh, you know, how do we have different student organizations um, maybe work together? Um, I mean, and and I don't, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I think the more contact and interaction, ideally, that's not too forced, right? When you when you're an undergraduate, the better. Uh, and then I think the other part of this is experience of like like study abroad. Um, as a high impact practice that, uh, and I've led study abroad courses to different places, it's a strength in Missouri Southern, this kind of international mission um, that can just open students' eyes and uh, it, it gives them understanding of their own upbringing and kind of place in the world. And uh, so to me, those are life changing and the more we can have students have those experiences, the better. I agree. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Galen. It's been a great 36 minutes. I'm excited for the rest. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we should move into, into the second part and uh, it's talking a little bit about innovation. And I think I will pull up, let's see here. I don't. I think I won't do a slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about innovation, and you know that's a word that gets used a lot these days. The city of Joplin. I, I think you had Toby Teeter one as one of your uh, speakers at some point. And, you know that is really about creating more of an innovation culture in the city of Joplin that I think KCU and Missouri Southern uh, can be part of. Uh, and, you know, innovation, if, if you Google it, uh, you get all sorts of definitions, it's a new idea, a device, a process, uh, there are different types of innovation, but I, I've been doing some kind of reading and thinking about innovation, and I'll just share, share with you uh, kind of a few principles of what it takes, and uh, it, you know, I've been reading about different companies, different organizations that are very innovative, and the, the four practices 
that seem to build a innovation environment. Number one is, is time and freedom to innovate. So you may know that 3M, uh, based in the Twin Cities, is has long been known for innovative uh, culture. And many years ago, they started something called 15% time. So all their employees are given 15% of their time to step away from what they are working on kind of formally in their jobs and innovate. Think outside the box. Go across the 3M campus and have a engineer talk to someone from business or a physicist and just try to come up with, with new ideas. And the history of the post-it note is tied to this. Some of you probably know that the post-it note was really a innovation that occurred by, by accident, right? There was a chemist trying to develop a great adhesive. Well, it, did, it wasn't really a great adhesive, but it was okay. <laughs> and the next thing you know, this was you know used on paper and post-it notes were developed. But 3M creates time for everyone in that organization to innovate and they celebrate innovation. Uh, you know, another one is innovation culture and, and that's about making it a priority. 3M is an example, but Apple uh, is consistently voted to be the most innovative company or organization in the world uh, every year. Uh, everything they do is about doing things better and innovating. Uh, if you uh, if you want to view a really interesting TED talk, some of you may have done this. Uh, Simon Sinek uh, has a video on the why, focusing on the why, and he talks about uh, companies like uh, Google and Apple who focus on the why and then go from there. Uh, another the third one is bottom to top innovation. So a lot of times we think about well the the president or the department chair, they should be the ones innovating. If you look at Toyota, for many years, they have a culture in which every employee, whether you're working on the assembly line in the office, is expected and encouraged to, to innovate, come up with new ideas. And every year, there are over a million new ideas developed at Toyota by everyone throughout the organization. And those are uh, sincerely looked at, examined, and has resulted in a lot of innovations in a company that you might not think of as being innovative. And then finally, and I think this is kind of the fun one to think about, acceptance of risk and failure, right? So if you think about KCU, if you think about Missouri Southern, uh, is there a culture that encourages risk, appropriate risk, uh, and innovation and accepts failure. So Apple and 3M are good examples of companies that, that do just that. You know, some cultures basically uh, in different ways uh, penalize you for, for making a mistake or having an idea that doesn't pan out. Uh, and, and right, there's a, there's a limit to accepting failure, I get that. But is there a culture that, um, that accepts risk and an appropriate level of failure? So, you know, translating that to higher ed or any organization, um, I, I kind of get excited thinking about how can an organization be innovative and provide time and a culture that encourages innovation among its employees, but also thinking about our students. I'm always amazed by students who are given and some, some time and opportunity and support to be creative and innovative. A lot of our students don't have the same kind of boxes that all of us have developed over time in terms of boundaries of our thinking. And uh, you know, one, of the, one of the aspects I'd really like to encourage in different ways at Missouri Southern is, is that culture of innovation. So I'll, I'll stop there on that. And that's, that's kind of the second part of my talk. And I'd love to hear if you have any any thoughts on innovation and, and if that's something that KCU has kind of purposely thought about. I have a quick comment. Um, KCU has, in my view, put me personally in a position to where I can innovate and 
I don't think I've made too many mistakes yet. I haven't felt any rains pulling me back. Um, and the fact that, you know, my laboratory is on your campus uh, is, I think, proof positive of that. And what I'll say here is I had a very interesting international student uh, in my laboratory from MSSU, uh, Uche Mbike. And as, as we move forward, I would just think if it ever comes up, uh, you have an international student in particular looking for uh, basic research opportunities, send, send them my way. Um, I went to University of ne Nebraska, a very homogenous farm-related university, and then went into university with graduate students as a technician, was exposed to all kinds of cultures um, immediately, and learned the value of diversity early on in, in my career. So I think one thing that your institution brings to the table is that diversity. And I just want you to know, I'm open to that on your campus, big time. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Well, let, let me then uh, kind of transition to Missouri Southern and uh, Jeff, about how much how much time do we have left here? I don't want to keep anyone. You've got 17 minutes. Okay. So I've been here about six weeks and uh, in preparing for this opportunity, I learned a great deal about Missouri Southern State University. So I'll, I'll share a few uh, perspectives and ideas. And then again, I'd really love to hear your thoughts. I know there's a, a great connection between KCU and Missouri Southern, uh, but and I know there are a number of uh, Lion graduates uh, out there as well. So uh, Missouri Southern is, uh, I think, a success story in, in higher education in many ways. I've known about this institution for a couple decades, um, initially because of the international theme within its mission. Uh, so for many years, and when President uh, uh, Leon was here, I think this was a major kind of centerpiece for him and the institution. Uh, Missouri Southern actually has a state mandated approved mission that includes an international theme. And I think it's part of the culture here that I find really interesting and exciting. It's something I believe deeply in um, all the way from when I was at, at Truman developing a study abroad course to Norway um, in, in environmental science. But I've just seen the impacts of internationalization on, on students in many different ways. Uh, so that was certainly very attractive when I looked at, at Missouri Southern. Uh, it's also an institution of uh, opportunity. About 60% of the students are first generation college students. Uh, I, I like to say that Missouri Southern adds more value to our students than Harvard adds to their students. So, you know, that's a, a maybe a strange way of saying a Missouri Southern uh, takes students where they are and, and elevates them and brings them to a different level by the time they graduate. Uh, Harvard's a great institution, don't get me wrong, but they're starting with some pretty um, academically prepared and also higher socioeconomic level students than in Missouri Southern. But I think it's it's exciting to be part of that mission and that activity. It's a place where the faculty are very focused on students, on teaching, but also uh, are interested in research. And one of the goals of the university is to advance research and innovation on campus. Uh, specifically, one of the goals is to increase undergraduate research, and, and that is um, something I'm very passionate about. Uh, and I think many of you have had those experiences to see the impacts of undergraduate research, undergraduates working with faculty on projects, and often that motivates them to graduate or professional school. It helps them to see what is possible uh, that they could not have imagined before. And, and I think that's very, uh, very exciting and uh, something I'd like to work with the faculty on building here. 
uh, at, at Missouri Southern. I also have found quickly that the connection between Joplin and this university is really strong and very, very important to, to people from city leaders, to business leaders, to legislators. Uh, so I think that's something that is important. Uh, it's, it's well positioned now, but I, I wanna continue to build on that. Um, and the last part I'll kind of pivot into is healthcare and health science. And, and again, it's pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, you look at Missouri Southern uh, and its history and, and strengths in nursing, dental hygiene, some of the other health science related fields. You look at KCU, uh, a, a large outstanding medical school, uh, dental school uh, is you know, on its way. You have Freeman and Mercy uh, in Joplin and the region. And it just seems like it is the, the perfect storm of entities, organizations that have come together, but can come together even more to make this a, uh, you know, a huge strength of the region and Missouri Southern State University. So I'm really interested in, you know, first learning more about what, what has been done and, and um, building those relationships with, with KCU, with the hospitals, um, but also envisioning what is possible. What are the next steps? Uh, how can we work together? Um, and, and so I'm excited about a lot of things. I'm, I'm less excited about COVID-19 and the budget cuts, but you know, getting beyond that, um, I think this, this university has great potential. And, and part of that is in the area of, of health science. Uh, so with that, I, I, I'd love to hear any comments or questions you have uh, specifically related to health science or, or anything else. I have a quick comment and then I'll get to you, Bucky, okay? Uh, I couldn't agree more with what you just said and, and Dr. Talley, you'll be right after that. Um, I would like I would like to encourage you at this point to think of the MSSU KCU Research Consortium, the MKRC, as nothing less than a platform upon which not just MSSU and KCU can come together, but the other entities you mentioned and that we've already interfaced with, including Freeman Health Systems, Ozark Center, uh, a long-term acute care facility in town and other um, institutions are, are coming our way as well. So just planting that seed for you. Uh, Dr. Agbas, you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sedinger. Dr. Uh, Dr. Sedinger, wait, wait a minute, what is this? Okay, just... Uh, uh, I hate this plugs and then it says out of battery. Okay. Dr. Stadinger, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So you planted seed. I'm just pouring the little uh, life water. <laughs> Dr. Van Galen, I'm proposing you one thing. Make the KCU basic science universe, uh, faculty, some clinical faculty also, as an affiliated faculty to MSSU, so that we can receive the PhD students because we don't have an official PhD program. We can receive your PhD students and then train in our laboratories. We can just talk the specific later on, but we have to have a kind of, we have an organic relationship, but let's make it more workable organic relationship. If I'm an affiliated with the MSSU, then I can receive or, you know, the mentorship of your students that students will finish up the, you know, the didactic lecture, but the, now the, let's say two or three years of their life. So they will be spending the time in the, in the, in the laboratory. I am very much happy and entertaining this uh, option that we can make it really uh, more than consortium, but really a more organic relationship that we can produce. That will also help for KC to establish its own PhD program. Let's just uh, masticate this idea and then see what comes out. So, uh, Dr. Agbas, let me comment real quick, uh, Dr. Vangan. The basic science faculty here are uh, actually adjunct members. Unfortunately, MSSU did not have a PhD program, to my knowledge. Is that true, uh, Dr. Van Galen? That is 
correct. Yeah. So I do believe you have undergrad and big strengths in teaching. Are there any master's programs? There's, is there? One? Yes, there's um, several. Uh, I a master's in management, uh, master's in education, uh, and and I certainly would not sit here and uh, you know proclaim that we're going to But you know, the point is envision what is possible in terms of academic pro programs, collaborations. Um, you know, we have a start to that. Um, and I do think it's important to work with the health systems in the region too. What, what are their needs? Um, you know, I had a recent conversation up at Missouri State in Springfield. They have some programs and there might even be some, some collaborations that way as well. Uh, so, so really what I want to do is get, get the right people in the room um, and, and start talking about the future and what is possible. Okay, one, one more quick comment uh, for you, Dr. Ogbos, and then I'll throw it to you, uh, Dr. Talley. Dr. Ogbos, um, you know about the Cobb and the master's degree at KCU. Uh, I've been given a mandate, or at least I've been told it's okay if I try to start a master's degree program on uh, the campus of MSSU using our accreditation for biomedical science two-year based thesis degree. So that's an area I think for ripe for exploitation. Dr. Talley, you have a question. Well, it wasn't so much a question as it was something I think you need to know, uh, Dr. Van Galen, and that is that Joplin used to be a hotbed for jazz around World War II. Oh. That there were many, many big bands that went through there and jazz groups and all kinds of things, but it was a big hotbed for, for uh, jazz. Just I, I, did, know that. I did not know that. And uh, you know, it, it's fun learning about a new, a new place. And uh, frankly, I, I love Joplin. It's, it's a great size. There's a lot here. And I'm a runner, so I've been on the Frisco Trail a few times. So, yes. On the Jeff out to Joplin. <laughs> <laughs> no? Yeah. No wonder Jeff has the job. Yeah, he's a musician too. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a rock star in my own mind. I've heard the same thing, Jan, that uh, it used to be really big music town uh, and somehow it got snuffed out through the years. Sorry to hear that, but maybe we can, uh, together with Toby Teeter, get a, a burgeoning music scene. And that, you know, do you play any instruments, Dr. Van Galen? We're, we're going to start a band. Yeah. I played uh, trombone in high school for what Sweet. that's worth. Sweet. Because, yeah, we could get a funk, jazz, rock thing going on. <laughs> yes, yesterday I toured our uh, fine arts building with some of the faculty, and they asked the same question. They assured me that that would come back very quickly if I just picked up a trombone. But I, I, <laughs> I don't believe that. The previous president and I, he's actually a pretty good uh, guitar player, Alan Marble. Is that He's, right? I didn't know that. No kidding. He and I laid down some pretty heavy blues one night. <laughs> it was you great. always forget the banjo, Jeff. You always forget <laughs> the banjo. Yeah. We, <laughs> it'll all come together. Uh, I think we're going to convert the uh, Reynolds Annex into a music studio fairly quickly, just so you know. <laughs> I didn't get that memo, but yeah. <laughs> Just don't tell the president. Right. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions or comments for our, our excellent speaker? If not, I'd ask that we, oh, Ms. Boyer, Ms. Boyer, go ahead. I just wanted to um, add that, you know, as the research associate, I am typically non-COVID conditions on Missouri Southern campus full-time and being Having graduated from there, I am open, like Dr. Stoddinger, to students that are interested in research, opportunities to speak to these students. I know I've went to a couple of club meetings to try to let them know that we're on campus. So please reach out to us if there is an opportunity to expose these kids to the Cobb program and, you know, a, a potential for graduate um, route for Missouri Southern students that's in the biomedical department. That's great. Yes. Dr. Agbas. Yeah, I was curious about whether the uh, MSSU has a sister international university in the globe. You know, I, I think there are several, but 
I have not talked to Chad Stebbins yet about that, so um, I don't have an answer to that. Yeah, that, that would be very interesting because these are if the if this is uh, relationship is established, there is a constant uh, student coming and then visiting MSSU with no charge at MSSU, and then vice versa. MSSU universities can go to the counterparts because they have a yeah. program, the governmental uh, supported programs that. Um, like either the study abroad or the you know the exchange program that are one semester or two. Yeah, I I know we've done quite a bit in uh, South Korea, um, not so much currently, but we had a number of students from Saudi Arabia. Now, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia changed their scholarship program a few years ago, uh, but the the latest data I have is even this year we should have over a hundred international students. Um, but I, you know, as I said earlier. There is so much value in in that for for everyone. Okay, we're coming up to the top of the hour. Uh, you've generated a lot of good discussion. Uh, I will say, you know, I have on the neighborhood of fifty YouTube videos, and this is just not just pumping your ego. This is a fact. You have the number two hits on my YouTube channel for this seminar series. And it happened real quick. So something's in the water. They, there are people interested in what you think and what you say. So thank you so much for inviting us and, and, and coming to this seminar series. Appreciate you so much. Everybody, un unmask and let's thank our speaker, okay? Hey, thank, thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to uh, meeting many of you and working with many of you. Thanks a lot.